Hello, and welcome back to Better Tech. My name is Peggy Sai, and I'm excited to start off the new year with another technology podcast highlighting the evolution of AI governance and trust. And today, we're diving straight in with a guest who stands at the crossroads of innovation and business. Hi, Harry. Welcome to Better Tech. You are the CEO and co-founder of Breeze ML. According to your LinkedIn website, your vision is to integrate observability and trustworthiness into every AI pipeline. So let's start today's episode with your introduction about your company and your journey to Breeze ML. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Peggy, and thank you for your invitation. Um, so yeah, so I, I uh, so first of all, let me uh, break, begin by giving you a little introduction of myself and who I am, um, where we are um, in terms of the company and the product we're building. Uh, so I'm Harry, I'm a, a computer science professor at UCLA and I've been a professor for more than 10 years. So we started the company with my co-founder, Ravi Nachwali, who is also a computer science professor at Princeton University, uh, slightly over 1.5 years ago. So the company has been around since um, March, 2022. Um, and then uh, the main focus of the company at this point was to build um, AI governance systems that allow compliance officers and uh, tech people like um, machine learning engineers, data scientists to work very closely on implementing um, a set of policies, customized policies and, and executing the policies over the entire ML workflow uh, in a particular company. Um, so that's basically what we do. Um, yeah, so I think the reason why we started the company was because both I and, and my co-founder, Ravi, are what we call atypical academics. Although we've been academics for many years, um, our goal is never to just publish papers. Of course, it's great to publish papers, but we never wanted to stop at publishing papers. So for any projects that we have done before, uh, we usually went beyond publishing the paper. Then we get a paper published, we uh, release the code, uh, in open source communities, and we try to create a community around it uh, to make an impact. So basically, the goal is always to make impact uh, as computer system builders, computer system developers or researchers. So yeah, so basically, um, and how do you make even further, even bigger impact, right? So as we all know today, uh, it's very hard to make a big impact by just uh, releasing a few algorithms or publishing a few papers, even open sourcing a few algorithms, I, you know, is the amount of impact you can create is very, very little. So then we decided finally that we wanted to create a company so that we can commercialize a lot of the technologies that we developed at a school, um, at a scale, right? So eventually, hopefully, the stuff we develop can be used by many, many millions of people um, across the globe. Uh, so that's sort of the impact we want to achieve here. Thank you, Harry, for that introduction. And certainly, as you noted, it is a little bit atypical of a startup founder to come from more of an academic background. So I think that's yep. something I maybe want to dive a little bit deeper with you. So what type of specific experiences do you think coming from academics, being a lecturing professor, what type of exposure do you think that I gave you and what lessons learned do you think you take with you with that type of background now that you're building your own company? Oh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them. Actually, I wrote a blog article about it. So a lot of people saw the article. Um, I think one of the things that I believe is very important from uh, my academic experience was how to deal with people, right? Because eventually when you build a company, you're dealing with, you're dealing with a lot of people, especially in the beginning of the journey, right? It's very hard to get people to work with us, right? You know, the company was small and uh, especially before any funds came in, right? So if, when the funds come in, of course, you know, it becomes kind of like a more proof and people know that the company is going to succeed 
to a certain degree, um, then they were more likely to come. But then before any funds is committed, it's very hard to get people to come and to work with us. So you have to really try to convince people, you know, pre present a vision and, and letting people know, you know, how promising the company is and how promising this direction is. And then as a professor, I think we have been trained <laughs> over and over again. And then we have we have done this for, I don't know, many, many times to pitch ideas. Um, you know, when you write a grant proposal, you pitch to NSF, right? When you uh, try to hire uh, top-notch PhD students, you, you pitch to students, right? You want the students who come to your group as opposed to other groups. So how do you do that? So we've been trained a lot of times to, to sort of tell a convincing story, hopefully, that the students will eventually join us. And that kind of experience is definitely very, very useful. The other thing that I learned a lot from uh, my academic background was persisting. You know, how do you persist uh, sort of in the presence of failures, especially a lot of failures? <laughs> um, and then failures are inevitable uh, in sort of the journey of building a startup. Uh, again, so in the beginning, right? So you, especially in the bad market right now, we're not like talking about the market, um, you know, in 2021 or 2020, where you just show up and the money will just come in <laughs> automatically, right? So it's not the case here. Uh, you really have to demonstrate your, you have a very sort of well thought out idea and then you have a plan to carry out the idea and then you have the ability to uh, assemble a team to carry out the plan, right? So basically um, that requires uh, many, many different attempts, I would say, right? You attempt to pitch, right, multiple times and then until you finally get some VC that um, is willing to sort of pour the funds. But that journey itself is actually a very kind of a painful and, and uh, very painful and difficult journey. And so what I learned from my past experience was that you have to persist, right? You keep sending papers to those top conferences, you keep getting rejected, but that's fine. Every single time becomes a data point that help you improve the quality of the paper, improve the quality of idea, and you, you, you just move on, right? So you, you never give up. I think that's another thing that I learned. That's great. Those are certainly great lessons for any um, aspiring uh, startup founder today. But I think, as you said, one of the challenges in today's economy, in today's market, is the... Um, the, the lack of VC funding, right? I think it's a challenge than it was a couple of years ago. So being able to find the, the the niche or the resounding topic, the business problem that people are want to solve um, will help drive some, some of that um, support, I think. So certainly yeah. you you talked about Breeze ML. It's focusing on AI governance. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about what you see as the current landscape for AI yeah. governance and trust and why you wanted to uh, build a solution in that particular area? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. So I think the decision of uh, pivoting to this particular direction, well, we're in different, very different direction. We're, we're trying to build something else uh, like a year ago um, in the mm -hmm. beginning of this company and then we pivoted. The reason why we pivoted uh, to build uh, AI governance tools was primarily driven by the many, many conversations that we ran with our potential uh, customers and design partners, right? And we saw the need of governing AI, governing model development process, providing guardrails for model developers as they're developing models so that the models coming out of the process would be automatically compliant with whatever regulations, external regulations or internal kind of policies. Um, I think the market right at this point, the market is, I would call it is in a, is infancy kind of a stage or, or yeah, infancy uh, period, um, it is not really, it's not quite mature yet. Uh, as we're ta all talking about AI governance, AI regulations, we hear those uh, scary news uh, about, you know, AI potentially harming people or hurting people in some ways, and or at least producing biases and the fairness problems that would, uh, um, that hurt democracy, that hurt um, multiple, sort of aspects of our human lives. And you have heard those stories over and over, but if you start talking to customers, then they will find that um, only large enterprises care about the governance at this point, right? Mm -hmm. So small customers, you know, especially small kind of AI users, AI uh, companies, uh, they still have their focus on uh, doing whatever needs to be done uh, to produce business value, right? 
So I think one of the challenges that we're facing at this point is that, you know, we have to kind of educate the small business users, small business, uh, small companies, and raise awareness of governance and AI, AI compliance because the problem is a real problem. Uh, it's going to come quickly, even if a lot of those companies don't feel the need right now, but is the problem is going to come soon. Uh, so if you look at the EU market, right, the EU AI Act has already been finalized and they're looking to implement this, this law, I think in 2025 or 2026, basically allowing companies to have one or two years of a period at the buffer to get their, themselves compliant with, with the regulations. If you're, if you're not complying, by the time um, the AI, uh, AI Act uh, uh, takes effect, then you're facing, what you're facing is a big penalty. You're facing up to 8% of your uh, global revenue as a fine. Uh, which is a huge, right? Yeah. Not only you have to pay the fine, but also uh, your reputation is hurt, right? But there's also this reputational kind of risk that you have to deal with. Um, the other thing is that the U.S. market, I think the U.S. Is, is following the EU closely in terms of legislations. Although you don't see many of those laws um, that, that came out of at the federal level from the U.S., there are a lot of different state-level laws that are being discussed right now. And like, for example, California has a bunch of those consumer consumer laws, consumer privacy laws. If you actually uh, dig a little bit deeply into those laws, you find a lot of clauses and statements that are directly speaking about the use of AI. Uh, they call it automatic decision-making process. Um, so if you involve any of the automated decision process, decision-making process in your in your software, in your system, your service, then you have to be complying with X, Y, Z, right? So the laws are already there. So um, what matters here is that a lot of those small companies don't even know what the laws are about. And then, you know, because given that the landscape is so big, there are a lot of them, then which, which subset of them are applicable to their AI practices right now is still uh, very unclear, I would say. So what we do, what we're doing right now is that number one, we're building our product uh, to help companies um, get their easily get their uh, AI practice air pipelines compliant with regulations. Number two, we are working with law firms. We are looking working with consulting firms uh, to uh, run those webinars and events uh, with the hope that we can raise the the awareness of of the. The governance and the compliance in the space of AI, uh, so that more people would be aware and, and understand the importance of the problem. Um, so I think the market is getting there, but there's still a lot of challenges we have to overcome before that point comes. Thank you, Harry. That's a really great um, overview. And I think many of us have seen the effects of GDPR fines taking into effect. And uh, I think that was probably a great uh, foreshadowing of hopefully the impact to companies if they're not in compliance. So certainly there is a lot of talk around um, the AI and you talk also specifically about making AI more accessible, efficient and affordable. And I think this goes back to your comments about some of the smaller companies yeah. not necessarily having perhaps the same resources or same tech talent in implementing these type of AI solutions. So can you talk a little bit more about the concepts of accessibility, efficiency, affordability, and what the main challenges companies of all sizes will have in making AI more responsible and ethical of, of inside their company and in the products that they sell? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, this is a very good question. Um, I think, as you said, a lot of those small companies lack expertise and 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 manpower to implement um, the sort of guardrails. A lot of the guardrails that we're talking about that are necessary for responsible AI. But given that responsible AI is becoming increasingly important, um, I think there is absolutely uh, an urgent need of establishing. Uh, a governance system in, inside every single company, including small businesses, large enterprises, every single company. And, and there's actually a bunch of articles published by research institutes, various research institutes in the US and, and the EU that call for the establishment of AI board um, in, in companies because uh, you're not only selling products yourself, of course, selling products yourself is important, but also 
uh, oftentimes that companies also have to um, take on vendors, right? So you, you need something that you, you don't want to do, develop yourself, then you want to take on vendor to uh, provide that service. But then uh, a lot of the vendors, if you look at their software, their, their products carry uh, some level of AI, right? Some level of models. They have models embedded in their software. Then the question here is that how do you vet? How do you vet their, their solutions, right? And so for small businesses is very important because if you want to sell your, sell, your pro, sell your products into large enterprises, then it's always the case, at least now it's becoming more common that the large enterprises would actually assess the uh, your solutions, your services by um, asking you a set of questions regarding the governance of your models. If you don't have it already establishes governance system inside your company. And it's very hard to pass that initial kind of a, uh, scrutiny uh, from, from large enterprises. It's very hard to sell the products into those large companies. So um, it's very important. Um, but um, back to your question that what if we, I don't have enough of resources, right? So I only have, you know, four or five developers and all of them are working on training models. Like we're training model all the time without... Um, any additional sort of resources uh, working on governance, working on the other things, I would call it preventive uh, aspect of AI instead of generative AI, uh, aspect of AI, right? Um, I think this is not only the the problem with small businesses. It's not only sort of a efficiency problem with small business. The problem exists universally with large enterprises as well. Even if you look at a very large enterprise, very large companies, most people are more interested in working on generative tasks of AI rather than preventive tasks of AI. How do you define your KPI, right? So when you, you work with your managers to define your goals, your objectives and the KPIs, is it usually the case that the KPI has a bunch of items related to how your model, your task would produce business value, right, for the company, as opposed to how much money you save, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, Right. So, and then also the latter will be very hard to measure quantitatively. How do you measure how much money you can save by providing guardrails for your company, for example? You know, how do you measure without such a guardrail, you know, how much money you would, you would have to pay as a fine or uh, as a, as a result of a delay to the market? So those questions are very, very hard to answer. So that's the reason why I'm saying that the problem of lacking resources or lacking the manpower to work on those preventive tasks is a very universal problem that ex exists everywhere. So it doesn't matter whether you're in a small business or a large business, right? So I think what, what does matter here is whether or not you have the awareness of the importance of this problem. If you're aware that this problem is so important that if you don't work on it, it's eventually going to come and bite you. And then... Um, you should start thinking about potential solutions. One of the solutions here is that you can take on a vendor like us, for example, because um, we don't really charge you a lot, but we provide this kind of automatic solution that can be easily installed either on-premise on or uh, on the public cloud that can help you provide that guardrail as you're developing models, everything is kept neat and compliant. As a summary, I think, uh, uh, like I said, this is a, just like a universal problem. You know, everybody has to uh, uh, sit down and uh, spend some time thinking about. No, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I think everyone today, um, or even throughout most of 2023, have been talking about um, generative AI and, and how their individual organization can be implementing it. I think one of the things that I notice when I talk to from smaller companies to larger enterprises is actually who owns AI, right? Whether which C-suite executive yeah. um, is taking the ownership, whether it's a CIO or a CRO, a chief strategy officer, there, there are many C-suites or, you know, even the technology up to the CEO would all take um, ownership. So in your experience, when you are pitching and selling your product, which personas, which titles are actually owning and taking responsibility um, for an AI governance tool? And how do they ensure that it fits into the architecture of the existing tools today in terms of uh, other 
observability um, tools that they may have in place today. Yeah, very good. Um, I think the tricky part here is that AI governance is not only a problem that belongs to a single kind of organization or a single sort of under a certain, falls under a certain title or a single title, mm -hmm. right? So initially we thought this would be a problem that belongs to, that falls squarely into the purview of compliance officers, <laughs> right? Because, you know, a lot of companies do have this title compliance of chief compliance officer or chief privacy officer, right? Especially if you, if, you, uh, if the company does anything uh, to do with the tech with, or with consumer data, uh, they usually have this title of privacy officer, right? And as a natural thing for the privacy officer to take care of the governance issues of AI, right? That's what that that's what we, we saw before. And then we started pitching to companies and what we found out was uh, is definitely, I think privacy officers has some responsibility, has some say some, some sayings about um, the AI pipelines, but um, it's usually the case that uh, it belongs to multiple people, right? So, and there's a CIO or whoever the person on the tech side that own, that also owns part of the sort of governance because essentially it's a, it's a collaborative effort that requires the involvement of multiple parties. And so that's the reason why we position ourselves as a bridge between multiple communities, right? Because for example, compliance officers know a lot about the process. It's very knowledge. Those people are very knowledgeable about uh, the process and then the regulations, how to interpret the regulations, and especially in the context of a particular practice in your AI company. But they don't really know uh, as much about the model development, the tech side, right? How model came to be, for example. And it's a very sort of a complicated process and dynamic process of training models. So if you don't have intimate knowledge of how model came to be, it's very hard to understand and to make the right decision in terms of how to document those different processes, the different models, right? So, and on the other hand, if you just look at uh, the tech people, the information officers or, you know, VP of engineering or CTO on the tech side, and those guys have intimate knowledge of the tech stack, but they don't really have much of an understanding of why they have to be compliant or what do have to be compliant with respect to, right? So what regulations are applicable and, so basically, a lot of the problems arise because of the miscommunications uh, and the divide between the two communities. So we actually talked to a lot of companies. One of the examples we got from one of the potential customers was um, the tech side, the, the model developers spend three months, four months of time working very hard to train the model. And the night before the model is about to be deployed, the compl compliance officer says, hey, no, uh, give me a break. Uh, let me understand what's going on. And there's potential risk of being in compliance with that particular rule, uh, that uh, regulation from the state. And you know, give me a break and let me understand. Before I have a full understanding of what what is happening here, you cannot deploy anything. Very common. And you can, right, you can easily imagine what's gonna happen afterward. It's a kiosk on the tech side and nobody understood what's going on and nobody could understand why the compliance officers have to do this night before the deployment, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a big sort of divide and, and, and disconnection between the two communities um, that prevents these two parties from understanding each other, trusting each other, and building relationship between each other, right? And then the compliance officer is usually the most hated person in the company <laughs> um, because this person always adds tasks to, uh, to the developers, making developers do extra work uh, that is not their KPIs. So nobody really likes that person. So our goal is actually to bridge this gap and then empower the compliance officers uh, with the capability of understanding and visualizing and monitoring continuously what's happening on the model side, on the tech side, right? If there's any violations, the violation will be flagged right after it occurs. So the compliance officer get the notice and then start communicating with the tech people and I'm basically asking them questions about why you have the violations. Let's say why this particular PII field, uh, like for example, gender, now is flowing to the model training process and the model is, is being trained out of that sensitive data is not supposed to use. And those communication can ha happen instantly 
after the violations are seen, uh, effectively facilitating the communication, the trust building between the two communities. Um, so yes, back to your question, I think this is not only a problem with respect to one title, it's essentially a collaborative uh, uh, task uh, across multiple titles. Thank you, Harry. And I think you certainly um, highlighted the, the challenges, the real challenges that organizations face internally. Um, interestingly, I know you must probably talk to a lot of different industries or sectors when it comes to your product. And are there any in particular, any particular industries or sectors that you think are facing more unique challenges when it comes to implementing responsible AI? Yeah, of, of course. I, I think that, um, so given that the, there's a still a hype of uh, large language models, <laughs> Uh, a lot of companies uh, are moving into the space of uh, uh, trustworthy large language models like uh, LMs, and especially uh, given this lawsuit between um, OpenAI and New York Times, uh, you, mm -hmm. everybody knows that. And then, so we all know that you know a large language model can potentially be a very big concern uh, because models are delivered at the black box. If you just use the model as it is, without vetting. Uh, is fairness and, and, and trustworthiness, and it can uh, it can be a big concern, and eventually it's going to hurt you very, very, very hard. So I think a lot of companies are moving into the space. But my point here is that if you look at the, where the market is, the market is is definitely not large language model as, as with respect to governance. Large language models are great, right? There's a lot of issues, but most companies are just playing games with large language models, I would say, at this point, trying to understand what they can, how they can use large language models. So the market of governing large language models is clearly not there. Uh, so of, of course, for OpenAI is, is, or, or those foundation model builders is, is, is a critical problem that they have, to, they have to solve right away. But for the users of large language models, the governance is not there. It's, it's definitely not. It's going to be a problem in one or two years, but definitely not at this, this moment. So the sector of the industry that is facing the governance issues or facing the compliance issues um, most urgently is the sector of insurance providers hmm. and the, the sector of financial services, I would say. Healthcare is another one, but it's less urgent compared to the, other, the, the first two uh, sectors. For insurance providers, for example, you know this association called the National Association of uh, Insurance Commissioners, mm -hmm. Nike. That so uh, that that association just issued a model bulletin uh, a few months ago, uh, requiring every insurance commissioner uh, to establish an internal AI governance system hmm. before they can be qualified for selling insurance because otherwise it will be disqualified. And the reason is that those insurance providers, pretty much all insurance providers use AI in one way or another to predict um, like the premium amount, for example, you know, how much you should pay. Um, given a person's information, given the person's age, uh, given the person's uh, uh, income, um, you know, where it lives, so that information becomes input to a model that is embedded into uh, their, their decision-making process to predict how much money this, uh, this person should pay. So it's very easy if you don't pay extra attention to your model fairness and bias, it's very easy to train a model that eventually generates a lot of bias. It's super biased against certain subgroup of subcategories of people. And then if any bias has been detected, the company gets sued and you have to pay a huge to settle the suitcase. So that's the reason why insurance companies are extremely careful uh, in terms of understanding the fairness uh, and bias issues of the models and, and also uh, doing, um, trying whatever they can do to uh, produce models that does not lead to biases. So that's one sector that is uh, that is facing the problem right now, very urgently. The other sector is financial services. The logic here is very similar, right? Banks um, sell mortgage, right? They use various models to uh, predict information about, uh, you know, to do, for example, fraud detection, 
to predict the mortgage value, to uh, assess whether or not a particular investment is is uh, an action of a money laundry, for example. So a lot of those things are done automatically right now with, with the models. So if you're not careful with the model, you're definitely going to produce uh, some kind of a bias, which eventually will lead to uh, litigations uh, and, and fines. Then another interesting observation here is that if you look at look at those sectors of the industry, the models they use are very, very, very simple models. Mm -hmm. Linear models, I would call it first generation of AI, not even the second generation, not even DNN, like uh, deep learning models. They're very simple decision trees. You know those models that came in. Yeah. So very simple models. You train those models very easily with your laptop, for example. Um, very easy to train. Um, not like very far away from large language models. So this is the other side of the spectrum, I would say. So how do you serve those models well? How do you provide a governance system that can cover this entire spectrum of uh, simple model all the way to large language models? That is a challenge we have to overcome. And is that something that Breeze ML covers as well from simple yep. to, okay. Yeah, yep. we cover this entire spectrum and then we serve all three generations of AI. Terrific. So I know Harry, that we are almost to the close of this podcast. I can't believe that our time is up just because of all the fascinating insights um, and learnings you've shared with us today. But just as a closing question, really want to get your insights as the future trends of AI governance and trust. What do you think is going to be game changers in an upcoming year or next year? And how do you think um, uh, Breeze ML is positioned to really support these upcoming changes? Yeah, I think there are two aspects to that, to the answers, right? So why is that at the, the legislation level, um, uh, definitely there are going to be increasing number of laws and regulations that will be established in the next few years in AI. Uh, EU has been very advanced, has been way more advanced than the, the rest of the world. The U.S. is following very closely. And if you look, look at the U.S., like I said, uh, it, it, a lot of those regulations will happen at the state level, not the federal level. That's something that, you know, is agreement. A lot of lawyers agree to. The other thing is um, uh, the rest of, if you look at the rest of the world, uh, Singapore is also very advanced, uh, trying to establish their regulations and the governance uh, laws for AI, for data privacy. So I think the world is clearly moving towards uh, a stricter, I would say, a stricter realm of governing AI. Um, so, so that we make sure that uh, the human beings would not eventually be hurt by AI anyway. So AI would be the force for providing goodness, but not not sort of the fair, the providing har uh, like harming people, like hurting people, right? So, I think that is definitely the trend, and this is at the legislation level. But on the other hand, at the tech level, at the sort of a development level, there are definitely going to be uh, more and more governance systems develop. I think. Uh, on that front, um, a useful governance system would would be having to uh, touch, like I said, both sides of the, uh, the of the problem. One is the side of the compliance; the other one is the side of uh, the tech. You have to be able to provide automation uh, at the tech side through deep integrations into the tools and the systems, and, and you know the ecosystem that people use, uh, because. Today's AI practices are very fragmented, right? There are a lot of different tools that people use as you know, as this point, that you have to be able to provide a, a sort of bridge and connections that allow people to pull information from these various tools that these guys use and then uh, relay that information to the compliance officers to the other side of the wall, um, providing uh, enough of information for the compliance officers to make decisions, to document and to generate reports um, and, and etc. Um, I I think that um, at the tech level, I think a, a def, an inevitable trend would be sort of automations would be needed. More automation would be needed on both sides, um, as opposed to just providing a set of document interfaces. This is what most of the product uh, the 
most of the governance products are doing right now, right? They're just like providing a bunch of document interfaces, allowed compliance officers to document X, Y, Z uh, without any automation from the tech side that can automatically pull the information into sort of the, the compliance stack for the compliance officers to make decisions. So more automation will be needed. And I think Breeze ML is well positioned and that we already realized the importance of this problem that at the first day of this product, um, we actually designed this product in a way that actually serves as the bridge, right? So we provide deep integrations into the tech stack, uh, primarily because of our tech background, right? We know how to deal with the tech side. And then we have, we provide SDK that allows developers to very flexibly write code uh, to uh, provide information to uh, to the compliance officers. And on the other side, the compliance officers can easily monitor, you know, what is going on at the real time. So I think that's something that we do, very, which is very unique uh, at this moment in the uh, compliance uh, AI compliance landscape. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you so much, Harry. Yeah. And I certainly think it is as you said, even more important than ever to have the automation guardrails in place for AI, certainly as well as the human aspect, which in your yeah. case, as you mentioned, the compliance officers to do yeah. the checking and, and yeah. rechecking. Well, so, the other thing, so uh, Peggy, I, I forgot to say, but this is, which is also very important. I just, that just came into my mind um, that um, I think if you look at the, the regulation space, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties uh, and heterogeneity with AI laws and the regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also something that people have to take into account when they design governance tools or think about governance solutions. Um, so when we talk about AI regulations, it's not only those new kind of regulations, the laws that is uh, that were just uh, established. There's actually a bunch of old regulations, like very old laws that were applicable as well when AI comes into the picture. So I can give you an example. So like there's this house, uh, Fair Housing Act that was established 40 years ago, 50 years ago mm -hmm. in many states, right? If you look at the clauses of that law, there are a lot of different clauses that clearly say decision-making process have to obey uh, those bias criteria. But then at that point, like 45 years, 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, there was no AI. Of course, that clause doesn't have anything to, to do with, with, with models or anything. But now if you bring this, this regulation into this new sort of light of AI development and model development, all of a sudden those clauses become applicable. Mm -hmm. So eventually there are going to be a bunch of regulations that are simultaneously applicable to your AI practices. And then there's also... Um, there are a lot of unclarity, I would say, uh, with respect to the interpretation of the laws, because the laws were also always written at a very high level, right? Very high level, the 30,000 foot high level that, um, you know, it, it's, un it's unclear what it, it says about your particular practice, right? Without without explanations, without interpretation from, from lawyers and stuff. So I think that future, this is another trend I think we're banking on, which is, um, the uncertainty and heterogeneity of AI regulations, um, which dictates a more flexible system that allow compliance officers or CIOs or CEOs to easily create flexible rules instead of binding or tying to a predefined set of regulations. Um, this is also sort of a differentiator between us and other products. So similar products tie very closely to a predefined kind of pack of regulations. But in our system, uh, we, our product was designed in a very flexible way that you can easily customize your own rules, um, let's say, according to a new law or a set of different, different laws. Um, so it's a very flexible system. Yep. That's fantastic. And I was going to say that there's also a lot of laws that you may not know that will yeah. be defined in the future. So having that yeah. flexibility um, is, is certainly a key and a great differentiator. Um, so again, Harry, thank you so much. I really think that you provide a lot of fantastic insights to our audience in terms of what they should be thinking about when it comes to AI governance, 
and certainly providing us a, a fresh perspective in terms of what Breeze ML can provide in this space as well. So thank you for your time and please stay tuned for another episode of Better Tech for more topics about technology and AI. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. Thank you.